Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us in the world. And thank you so much for being here. Um, I have to say a special thank you to the organizers for inviting me back. I think I was with you last in 2018, 2019, certainly before the horrific events that we've experienced over the last couple of years. Um, and so to be able to, to be with you again today is so powerful. And by the way, I think the fact that we're all gathered here together globally from all the corners of the world, for today and tomorrow is an incredibly powerful testament. I think it's an incredibly powerful testament to the power and importance of education and to the incredible work that you do to prepare future generations to hopefully live and lead us into better, happier, healthier times. And as educators, there is absolutely no doubt and no moment like now to remember the extraordinary privilege and responsibility we have to ensure that we provide and prepare and educate for that future. Just to let you know, as I'm talking, the plan is I'm going to speak for a little while and then I'm going to take uh, questions. And um, I'll be taking questions at the end. So if any of you want to leave any questions or comments, please do in the chat box. And then if you want to leave a question, leave it in the question and answer box so that we can pick them up and we can talk about those things at the end. Um, but look, I can't, I can't begin the opening address of this session, of this conference, without spending just a little while dwelling on the past and the lived experience of the present. I mean, first of all, I need to touch on talking about COVID and the horrors of what the whole world has lived through and many of us continue to live through now. And I want to just take us all back a little bit to when this began this extraordinary global pandemic began. And I remember very clearly how it began for me. I was uh, working in Australia at the end of February, 2020. And I was at the airport in Melbourne, ready to fly home to the UK. And I remember sitting in the departure lounge and on the television in the departure lounge came a news flash and it was the Prime Minister of Australia, Scott Morrison, who came on to national television in Australia to urgently ask the Australian people to stop taking all the toilet paper from the shelves in the supermarkets around the country. I mean, who knew? You know, we were facing a global pandemic that the first thing that people would be wanting to hoard would be toilet paper. So Scott Morrison came on the television to address the Australian people to explain why they didn't need to hoard toilet paper. Now, the whole thing had begun and, and the, the terror around toilet paper shortages, I think, began in Australia because the Australian people, not unreasonably, believed that because the factories were shutting down in China and they believed that the majority of their toilet paper was manufactured in China, that the shortages coming across to Australia would soon click in. And so they started hoarding toilet paper. The prime minister came on television and said, look, people of Australia, you need to know that at least 90% of our toilet paper is actually made in Australia, so please stop hoarding. Anyway, I got on the plane and flew back to the UK and uh, thought no more about it and just thought, oh, well, this is something that's unique to Australia. And then by the time I'd landed in the UK, less than two days later, people in the UK were going crazy, 
hoarding toilet paper as well. Why? Because they'd seen video footage on social media of people in Australia taking all of the toilet paper, snatching it out of the hands of older people. And so the people here in the UK started to panic too. And that's how this whole thing began. Now, the reason I start with that story today is because the interesting question to me is why? Why, why did we do that? Why do we do that? And the truth is, of course, it's because it's a reflex we have when we feel a growing lack of control. We're desperate to find something to be able to grab hold of, to hold on to. You know, for so many of us now, as we continue to live through COVID, and of course, as we see the events, which I'm sure many of you are not just seeing, but are physically touched by in Ukraine. One of the most horrific feelings for all of us is that lack of control, that lack of ability to do anything. And that was so amplified for the world as COVID broke out across the planet and continues to do so now. And I just want to reflect a little deeper on that because I think it's hugely important in terms of how we view the future, how we view the future of education and what we need to think about when we're preparing future generations for the world that they are going to be inheriting from us. So when I think back, I got back from Australia and as COVID really started to hit and suddenly became something that was going to be real in our lives, I remember going through periods of mental paralysis. I can only describe it that way. Those moments where no matter how much you try and take in, no matter how much you try to learn, no matter how much you try to read or watch on the news or reference on the internet, Nothing was going in. You know, it's like those moments where sometimes you can be reading a book for pleasure or for work, and you know you're reading the words. But after 20 minutes of reading, you realize you haven't absorbed anything. Nothing has gone in. And I've experienced that mental paralysis so much over the last couple of years. I've also then experienced moments of denial. Oh, it won't be that bad. It won't be that serious. Oh, it'll be over this COVID thing by Easter. It won't, it won't be as bad as they all say. And of course, when grappling with that didn't make any sense and didn't make any difference. I've been through phases, as I'm sure many of us have, of anger. I know in my life, I don't think I've ever experienced as much personal anger as, as I have over the last few years or, or those people around me, the short fuse, the, the anger, the kind of, oh, just the, the pent up aggression. And then I think for me, the most profound point, the most challenging thing, I think have been the periods of despair, those moments where there appears to be a lack of hope. And no matter how many levers you try to pull, no matter how hard you try to grapple, nothing seems to give back control. And those moments of absence of hope, the kind of endlessness of what we were dealing with, what we are dealing with, the moments where we think, will there ever be a normality again? Will there ever be moments that I have to look forward to? And the reason. I share that, and I've been sharing it for months now. This four stages of the way we deal with things when we feel we lose control, when the world appears to be changing and there's nothing we can do to be active participants, has of course again reared its ugly head in the most horrific way in the events of what we're seeing in and around Ukraine, is a human reflex. And their human reflexes to any form of change, 
when we feel that things are being done to us, when we feel that we are simply passive receivers of what's happening in our world. And I think, you know, for years I've thought about this, not in the amplified way, obviously, we have over the last couple of years, that actually this is a crucial part of understanding learning and the reflex we all have to teaching and learning in any capacity. You know, as learners, it is so important that we feel like active participants in the process and not just passive receivers. Because again, I'm sure many of you will recognize some of these emotional states in the students you work with, the young people, or even your colleagues. You know, those moments of mental paralysis, of denial, of anger, of despair. Those signs of people becoming anxious because of that perception of a lack of control. You know, whether we're thinking about global crises, health issues, horrific attacks on countries, whether we're talking about the shift in global economy, whether we're talking about the global environmental crisis, whether we're talking about technology, which of course is a key theme of our conference over the next two days. How many times, for example, have you worked with colleagues and tried to encourage them to embrace and understand and use technology in new ways? And how many times have you seen them react through the reflex of paralysis, denial, anger, despair? And so often that's a sign of people who just don't feel they understand or have control. It's the cycle of human emotion around enforced change. And so what can we learn? What can we think about as we move forward and we try and evolve and hopefully come to points in the next few months or years where there does feel like there's an end, where there does feel that there's a reset, a brighter future? Well, so much actually lies in what we see in our youngest children, their innocence, their curiosity, their endless desire to discover, to find out, to question, to challenge. You know, I've said before and for many years, it's always amazed me how much learning goes on in our youngest children, in those kids under five, most of whom learn to walk and talk, to understand vocal intonation, facial expression, body language. They learn to make sense of the sensory world around them. And they all learn this stuff in the earliest years of their lives because no matter what's being thrown at them, and let's remember for a young child, the world is a daunting place. Every hour of every day is different. Things are being done to them and they're experiencing for the first time. But I don't know about you. I'm yet to meet an 18 month old child who's going through therapy because they can't cope with the rate of change and uncertainty in their lives. And the interesting thing, as we all know, as educators about education, is the more we spark curiosity in the people we work with, the more they feel they have a level of control, the more levers they feel they can pull, the more active they feel in the process of their lives. And I think now more than ever, as we continue to try and survive through these challenging times and hopefully move on, now more than ever, I think the need to make sure that we help our students, our young people, to continue to be curious, to continue to understand the power of asking questions, to make sure that as lecturers, as educators, we keep our learning open-ended so that our students feel like active participants, so that we don't create worlds where we underline a mythology of if you do what you're told in the right way, if you remember or learn what we need you to learn in the right way, your life will be good. That we have to put curiosity 
at the absolute heart of everything we do and everything we believe in. I'd like to introduce you to one of my heroes. Um, some of you may have heard me talk about him before. This is, this is Barry Barish. Now, as well as some people say, looking a little bit like my grandfather, and I wish, by the way, Barry Barish was the 2017 Nobel Prize winner for physics. He is a remarkable, brilliant man. Experts put him right up there as one of the most influential thinkers and scientists of the modern world. He got his uh, Nobel Prize, his research team got their Nobel Prize for their work into gravitational waves. Anyway, a couple of years ago, I got to interview Barry. And when I get to interview remarkable people like Barry Barish, I often want to know about the kind of people they like to work with, that they want to employ, that they want to, to bring in, if you like, to their circle and fold. Because in so many ways, it's the kind of questions that I, as an educator, never got to ask when I was in the classroom, when I was teaching. But they're such crucial questions. Because in many ways, one of the great challenges as we move forward in education is not to believe the answer just lies in educators. If we're truly going to help prepare our children for what we know is an increasingly uncertain and challenging and different world, we have to look way beyond our own perimeters and boundaries to seek the challenges we need in order to make sure we're doing the right job for those young people. And actually something Barry said really underlined that for me. So there I am and I asked Barry one question. I said, how did you go about recruiting people to your research team? He said, it was a good question. I thought, phew, you know, I'm a very simple guy, but for a Nobel Prize winner to say, that's a good question. That, that made me feel, that made me feel much better. Anyway, I said, well, how many, how many applicants did you have? He said, well, actually, Richard, it was astonishing, the interest that was shown. We had just over three and a half thousand applications to join our research team. I said, and how many places did you have funding for? He said, well, actually, again, we were out of Caltech. We had a remarkable amount of funding. I had enough funding to fund 138 researchers. I said, but how on earth did you get from three and a half thousand to 138? He said, I'll tell you. He said, the three and a half, of the three and a half thousand, many, were world-renowned scientists, people with at least two doctorates to their name. Um, just one is staggering enough to me. He said they were uh, two doctorates, their name. Most had had their, um, they'd had their articles published in the most important journals around the world. They had reputations in their field. I said, so how on earth did you reduce that down to just over 130? So I'll tell you, Richard, there were two critical caveats. And many of you will know this better than I, because you work in fields of education where you're challenging the boundaries all of the time. And thank you. He said, the first is this. He said, I don't think it's particular to science, but it's something I've seen regularly in the field of science. That the further people go in their careers, the more narrow and blinkered they become the more they're focused on their area, their discipline, the more they then hang out with people who are also focused on the same area, the same discipline. He said, and so what happens is they start to breathe increasingly rarefied air. And of course, the truth about research is it's not about substantiating what you already know or trying to prove what you already do. It's the opposite. He then said something to me, which I think is one of the most elegant things anyone's ever said about education, about research, about change, about development. He said, I was looking for three-dimensional people. 
I needed people who had the courage to challenge the beauty of the proof. I love that. And actually, in some ways, shouldn't that be the strap line of great education? We're looking to develop people that go on to have the courage to challenge the beauty of the proof. As an aside, I wonder sometimes, given the misinformation and manipulation we see in parts of the world right now and, and through modern history, that actually that is one of the great characteristics we need to develop in all of our young people, the courage to challenge the beauty of the proof. He said, now, in order to do that, you need those three dimensional people. He said, so I wasn't interested in people who on their CVs just had their field of science, their discipline, their research. He said, I needed to know that people coming onto my team were interesting. They were three dimensional. They were, had passions and interests in the arts, in humanities. I wanted people that had fascinating hobbies, stories to tell beyond their job. And he said the second caveat, and I love this too, because of the elegant simplicity of it, but the challenge it promotes. He said, nobody made it onto my team if they didn't have the ability to ask stupid questions. Isn't that brilliant? I mean, we could spend all day debating that. Is there such a thing? What did he mean? But I think we know. I think we've all been environments in our colleges, our universities, in our faculties, in our teams, with our students, where you or others have been desperate to ask a question, to say something, but for whatever reason have been too intimidated to do so. And so for me, one of those fundamental foundational challenges about education and beyond is something we need to continue to focus on and think about. I want you to imagine as an educator, that every time you walk into a lecture or a classroom with your students, you're walking in a bit like a croupier into a casino. Because the one thing, of course, we know about learning, about education, is it's tough. It needs to be absolutely right that it is. Because, of course, the universal truth is that we learn nothing new by getting something right any of us. We only ever learn something new from the point of a mistake or the realization that we don't know something or can't do something. And that makes learning tough because that means we have to have enough self-confidence, resilience, self-esteem to be able to actively engage in that process. Whether we're a young student, an older student, a doctoral student, whether we're already highly qualified professionals working at a high level of capacity. And the interesting thing is this, you walk into that lecture room, into that classroom as the croupier, and you spin the wheel and you roll the ball. And what you're asking is the, the people who are participating with you, you're saying to them, right, engage with me. And in order to engage with me, I need you to bet some of your self-confidence, your self-esteem, your resilience. Now, of course, every one of those people is walking into your environment <clears throat> with poker chips. Now, there are the high rollers. We all know them. Those colleagues, those students who have huge amounts of resilience, self-confidence, self-belief, sometimes too much, maybe. But anyway, they walk in and they've got hundreds of poker chips in their bag. And you say, come on, engage with me. And they chuck poker chips on red or black or odd or even, or even an individual number. And then there are others who are in our casino who are looking at the game thinking, I love this game. This, the game looks, this game looks great. I'd love to take part in this game, but I've only got 
one poker chip. And if I put that one poker chip on red and it comes up black, or I put it on odd and it comes up even, I've got nothing left. So what I'm gonna do is hold on to my poker chip and hide in the shadows and just hope I survive. And I think for me, that's one of the great challenges as we think about preparing young people for the future. We need to make sure they have huge levels of resilience, of self-confidence, so that they can deal with whatever that wheel throws up, whatever number, whatever color, and that we need to make sure that we don't take it for granted. And over the last decade or so, I've had the privilege of working in many fields, one of them being elite sports. And I remember when I first got involved in elite sport, one of the challenges we were looking to understand was why so many of the most naturally gifted athletes never made it to the highest level. And actually the attrition rate, the rate at which they would walk away was really huge and accelerated around the ages of 16 to 18 and some into their early twenties. And what we discovered probably isn't clever, but it's one of those things that I think we really need to understand. Because those kids, and we've all known them in our lives, those young people, those very young children who are just naturally brilliant at sports, at athletics, you know, they can catch a ball, throw a ball, see a ball, they can run faster, they're stronger, their balance is extraordinary. And so they're better than everybody else as young people and they rise up through their schools and their colleges and then eventually they might get to an elite academy on the pinnacle of a professional career. And for the first time in their lives, they're surrounded by other people who are as talented, if not more talented than they are. And because they've never failed, they've never struggled, they've never come through adversity, they don't possess the resilience, the self-belief and self-confidence to overcome the problem and the challenge. And that's why many of them walk away. And by the way, as I understand it, and again, many of you will know much better than me, but some of our highest performing academic students respond in exactly the same way. We make the mistake of thinking because they've risen through the education system, acing everything, they don't and can't believe that they can cope when rightly we push them to real challenge and when they're surrounded by other people who are as bright, if not brighter than they are. Now, the good thing for me is this, that the poker chips are put into our bag. We win the poker chips every time we find a way to overcome a challenge or a problem. You know, those moments where whether we're a child dealing with learning or whether an adult dealing with some of the complexity of the challenge of our lives and we dread something or we find something really nerve wracking or frightening. And then we find a way through. Every time we do that, every time we come back from a challenge, we're putting another poker chip in the bag. And whilst we're talking at the moment and reflecting on the horrendous damage that COVID and war is having on our young people, that actually maybe one of the signs of optimism for the future is because we, they, are living through times of adversity and hopefully some, many of us are going to come through it. Every time they're putting a poker chip in their bag, so maybe there will be a resilience that we don't yet understand moving forwards. And as educators, I think that gives us a wonderful opportunity for hope, to realize that actually they could be a hugely resilient generation and that'll make them 
a ready generation for learning. Let me move, move on. And please, can I remind you all that if you have any questions that you'd like to raise, which I can pick up at the end of my input, if you can put them in the question and answer box, that would be fantastic. I'll, I'll take a look at those and, and respond to as many as I can. Thank you. So let me move on. And let me talk about one of the other things I think is so incredibly important, that as we live through complexity and times of challenge, I think it's really interesting to reflect, particularly on a human experience, how so much of the complexity that we'd surrounded ourselves with pre-COVID, pre some of the horrendous things we're seeing now, were based around the belief that in order to be clever, in order to be right, in order to have new ideas and new thinking, they needed to be complicated. A few years ago, I got to visit this place, which is the world's first Starbucks. It's in Seattle, in Washington State, in the US. I'm sure some of you may have been there. Anyway, I had a day off. I was, I was working with Microsoft at the time. I had a day off and I thought I would visit the world's first Starbucks just to be able to say I'd visited the world's first Starbucks. Don't know why I don't particularly like Starbucks, but there you go. Anyway, it turns out everybody else in Washington, in Seattle on that day, who had a day off, had the same idea as me, because I arrived at the world's first Starbucks, and the queue went back for about a kilometer and a half. But I decided I needed my moment, mainly to show off to my children, who at the time were growing into teenagers, and I wanted them to show, I wanted to show them how cool I was, how groovy, and just by using that word, you know how much I've failed. Anyway, I queued up and I was there for over an hour. And I was quite excited as I got to the point at which I took this picture. But something you'll already know about me is I am an incredibly simple human being. And the way I drink my coffee reflects that. I drink coffee incredibly simply. I just have it black in a cup about this big. And so I'm queuing, ready to go and order my cup of black coffee in a cup about this big. And I get to this point and I start to hear what's going on inside the shop. Now, what's happening inside the shop doesn't appear to be people ordering cups of coffee. It was like rap urban poetry. People wanting 15 different things they wanted done to a hot cup of liquid. You know, they wanted a brevet half and half with soya milk and cream this. And they wanted caramel syrup, but they wanted it sugar free. And they wanted decaf, calf, something. And, and then every order finished with and make it extra hot, which even now blows my mind. I don't understand. It's a cup of coffee. But anyway, what was then happening at the end of these incredible orders, this poetry, was the baristas and everybody else in the queue who clearly were big Starbucks fans were clapping and yaying and yeah, whoa, great order. And I was thinking, oh my God, in a minute, I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna order a cup of black coffee in a cup about this big. And I could feel people's disappointment. So I did the only thing that was available to me, big brave Englishman, in that moment of adversity, I turned around and ran away. And as I ran away, I reflected on the question, when was it that we started to believe that things could only be of value if they were complicated? And I wonder sometimes in education, whether in order to gain credibility for some of the views and values around education, whether we're overcomplicating the language, we're overcomplicating what we're doing and what we're saying and how we're training people to educate. And actually whether that's having a, de um, a detrimental effect on some of us, because it's hugely intimidating a number of people who work in and around education. You know, for me, and maybe it is an oversimplification. Education should be based on four principles. Do I know my students? Do I know what they need? Am I helping to design and deliver what they need? 
and how do I know it's working? And I wonder sometimes whether the constant march for new initiatives, new ideas, whether it's technological, whether it's pedagogical, is leading us down the line of so many silver bullets being fired to try and find the answer. That for me, I wonder if two things are happening. One, are we overcomplicating the fundamental process of education and learning? That's not to say that the research and new thinking isn't hugely important. But do we really need everybody to have all of it in order for them to feel like they're a good educator? That's the first thing. And the second thing, and I ask you to reflect on this, not just over the next two days, but moving forward, is how many of those silver bullets, those new ideas, that new thinking is really based on evolving and transforming the education system to meet the needs of the future. And how much of it actually is pulling us back into just how do we make what we already do more efficient? And with that in mind, a couple more thoughts for you. I'm gonna talk maybe for another 10 minutes or so, and then I'd love to take any questions or comments from you. And so now, more than ever, I believe, is a time to take a step back and to really understand what is our vision? What do we want our students to look like as human beings when they leave our institutions? What do we need them to have in order to thrive in this incredibly challenging world? Are we doing enough, for example, with young people to teach them how to decipher fact from bias, from opinion? Are we doing enough to ensure they understand the power and potency of manipulation? Are we helping them understand that the world isn't certain? How are we making sure that we help them understand that the future isn't about competition, but about collaboration? And what does it look like to be somebody who truly understands and embraces a collaborative process? A while back, I got the chance to meet this remarkable woman. Some of you may know her. This is Manoush Shafiq. Manoush Shafiq is currently the director at the London School of Economics. She was, for a number of years, the deputy governor of the Bank of England. And there are many who believe that she could be the first woman to break one of those great glass ceilings in Britain to become the first female governor of the Bank of England. She is a brilliant, brilliant economist. And a few years ago, she was at the World Economic Forum at Davos, and she was talking about the future of education. And there are a couple of things I'd like to share with you, which she said, which really resonate for me. The first is this, which is not new stuff, but it's really important that it's not just people like me, you know, people who are seen as some kind of artsy liberal, but actually hardcore econo uh, economists. She said that anything that's routine or repetitive will be automated. The soft skills, creative skills, research skills, the ability to find information, to synthesize it, to make something of it, will be what defines success in the future. I wonder how much of that is truly in our plan, our curricula, our syllabus, our methodology for our young people. But actually, it was the second thing she said, which I think is so incredibly resonant and challenging and a catalyst for a whole nother conversation that really stood out for me then, and it does even more potently now. She said, it's no accident that people who voted for populist parties around the world are people with, by and large, low levels of education. And it's not because they're stupid. It's because they're smart. They've figured out that the system as it is will not be in their favor. And 
I've thought about that a lot since I first heard us say it. Uh, and it's something I just want to take a second to really think about. Because when we think about this, thing, this, and we think about the lurch in the world and the challenges that we're facing, not just through COVID or the conflict in and around Ukraine, but actually the rise in populism over the last few years, elections of certain deeply divisive politicians, decisions made in countries like the UK to nationalize or renationalize. You know, the people that have voted for these things, made these decisions or supported them, aren't bad people, they're good people, most of them, hardworking, really good people, but they're angry. They're angry. And they're angry because in many ways, the lives they were promised by getting their heads down and doing what they were told haven't surfaced. And if they had, they've been taken away from them. And the uncertainty is growing. And of course, people then do go back to what I said at the beginning. Go into denial, anger, despair. And so surely that's a challenge for us all in education. Look, I'm coming to the end. I've got one more thought for you, and then I'm going to take some uh, questions and thoughts. So please, any questions or thoughts, put them in the question and answer box. But I'm going to I'm going to make one big finish, if that's OK. And um, I'm sure some of you have heard me tell this story before, because it's one of those things I talk. I tell everybody. And having been stuck in this virtual box now for too long that I can remember, I'm just, you know, I'm not even going to apologize for it. Just before COVID struck me, us here, I got the chance to meet one of those people who was on my fantasy uh, guest list. I'm sure many of you have had them, got them, those list of people you would love to share a conversation with. And just before COVID, I got to meet one of the top two or three people on my list. And it was an extraordinary moment for me. You know how people say, never meet your heroes or beware of meeting your heroes because they often disappoint you. Well, this, this person didn't. I got the chance to spend 20 minutes, 20 minutes with him. There's a couple of things I just want to say about this picture, if that's okay. The first is, that isn't a waxwork. That really is President Obama. The second thing is, look how happy he is to see me. I was obviously on his fantasy dinner party list too, who knew? And the third thing is, isn't it amazing how many chins a COVID beard can hide? I'm keeping this now forever, no matter what. But I want to finish by telling you about the core of the conversation we had. And I urge you to reference it and think about it as you go through the next two extraordinary days. And particularly as we reflect on the world we're living in and experiencing now. I asked him a question. I had the chance to ask him one question. And the question I asked him was this. What do you think is the most important thing that you learned during your eight years in the White House. And he smiled that smile and I melted. And he said, I'll tell you. He said, Richard, when I first arrived in the White House, I was like a, a kid in a candy store. He said, because of the position I found myself in, I was able to employ the most technically brilliant minds on earth the most technically brilliant scientists, economists, political strategists. It was an extraordinary position to be in. But when I realize and reflect on those eight years in the White House, what I realize is this, that virtually none of the problems that crossed my desk, just reflect on that for a minute, the problems that crossed his desk. He said, virtually none of the problems that crossed my desk were actually technical by nature. They were human. They were about love 
anger, jealousy, greed, hatred, tribalism, fear. He said, and, and that to me is the most important thing I learned, that actually we spend too much too quickly in reflex of dealing with a challenge or a problem, in immediately looking for the technical solution without truly understanding the humanity behind it. And as we move forward and continue to deal with extraordinarily challenging times, I ask you as I end to reflect on exactly the same thing. As you think about the next two days and the development and the future of education, that we don't just pick up and go with whatever the new silver bullet is, whatever the cleverest technical idea is, that actually we really spend time thinking about the human condition behind it in our students, in our colleagues, in our communities, globally. What do we need to develop in our future generations to help them as human beings, not just survive, but thrive? in that challenging future. So thank you all so much for listening. Thank you for your attention.